Welcome to South by Southwest 2022, and welcome to Health Equity, Developing a Shared Mindset for All Patients. I'm Moira Gunn, and I'm your moderator today. You might know me as the host of Tech Nation and Biotech Nation on NPR. You might know me as a professor of bioentrepreneurship at uh, the University of San Francisco. That's where we we take everything from the lab bench to a registered product, and it crosses many disciplines. Um, let me introduce our first panelist today. It's Dr. Pratiba Varki. She's president of Mayo Clinic Health System, and you are also a professor of medicine and a professor of preventative medicine at the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine. Yes, Mayo has a school of medicine. Uh, now, everybody's heard of the Mayo Clinic, but in fact, there are many, many parts to it. What is the original sort of famous Mayo Clinic that is in people's minds, uh, and today is many things, uh, and within that Mayo organization, what is the Mayo Clinic Health System? Where is it? What does it do? So uh, Mayo Clinic is based in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, which is where we were founded uh, close to about 160 years ago. Uh, and Mayo Clinic Health System, which I represent, is the community branch of Mayo Clinic. We are located in about 46 different communities in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa. Uh, about 60% of us are in rural communities. Uh, and so really take great, great pride in uh, learning more about our communities and, and really working with our communities through community engagement efforts in addressing uh, healthcare issues, and, and you'll hear uh, hopefully more about it as uh, the discussion proceeds. Uh, we are also the home of about uh, 15,000 employees and uh, a little over 1,000 physicians. And how many hospital centers? We have you? about 16 community hospitals and uh, a little over 50 multi-specialty clinics. Great, thank you. Now let me introduce Dr. Martin Mendoza. At NIH, that's the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Mendoza is the Director of Health Equity for the AOU Research Program. AOU stands for all of us. Dr. Mendoza, Martin, welcome. Thank you, Maura. Most people at least have the sense that NIH does a lot of research. Yes, well, certainly it does do that, and it funds a lot of research, not just in the United States, but also globally. In fact, NIH funds more research globally than any other entity worldwide. But this leads to global research. This, this is not just global research by, by other people. There's also research done right on campus at NIH through its, in its many institutes. Is it 27 or 26? 27. 27 by an act of Congress. They have to move things around when, when things change there. Now, Mendoza, in introducing you, I mentioned the AOU, the All of Us Research Program. Where, are you, where you are the director of health equity, what is the AOU program, and what's your specific role in it? So, so thank you, Maura. So the All of Us Research Program, um, AOU, is a, it's a historic effort to enroll one million folks um, across the U.S. that reflect the diversity of the, of the U.S. So historically, um, many communities, especially those of color, have, have not been able to participate in research for a number of reasons. And, and so what, that, what happens is that those communities then aren't able to uh, reap the benefits from that medical research. So the All of Us program, we're working to, to try and, and fix that. We want everyone to join our program, hence the, the term All of Us. Now let me introduce our final panelist. He's Winslow Tucker, Senior Vice President, Intercontinental at Bristol Myers Squibb. And uh, Winslow, welcome. Thank you. Now you need to get closer to the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, that's what the that's the NPR part of this. You gotta get you gotta love the mic, Winslow. That goes for everybody. Um, now, Winslow, Bristol Myers Squibb is a U.S. pharmaceutical firm with a global reach. Uh, it's nearly 150 years old. It's always listed in the top 10 global pharmaceuticals firms. And Winslow, you know, delivering pharmaceuticals is harder than most people imagine. You know, here in the U.S., you know, you get prescribed some pills, you pick them up, you put them in the medicine cabinet, you take them one or two at a time. You know, it's like, oh, maybe you got to get an injection, you got to go to the doctor, get an injection, as just a couple of examples. But some medications need to be refrigerated. Some need to be delivered by injection. Uh, some are inhaled. Some IV drugs are not, are you, a patient must sit there for two, three, four hours per treatment. 
Um, then there's maintaining what we call the cold chain. You know, if you're, you're, you're manufacturing it in one place and it has to get all the way halfway around the world, it has to remain cold. We saw that problem with the vaccines and COVID. The COVID vaccines had to be, the cold had to be maintained. And then there's just climate of where the drugs are globally. There's uh, from freezing Alaska to open up a remote river and a steaming jungle in the Amazon to inner cities worldwide, lacking basic hygiene uh, to um, rural areas. And even here in the United States with the poor, the uneducated, and sometimes even illiterate. What does it say on the bottle? Good luck with that. So much of our careers, have, have your career has been in the treatment of cancer, rare diseases, hematology, and so forth. How does Bristol Myers, Myel, how does Bristol Myers Squibbs Pharmaceuticals take a product that finally, after 12 to 15 years uh, and a billion or two in investment, finally works and attempt to deliver it to literally every human on the planet? Well, well, thank you. I think it's important to understand the vision. Uh, one, the vision is to transform patients' lives through science. And our mission is really um, to discover, develop, and then deliver those products to patients, help them prevail over serious diseases. And that means that we then uh, look at where are those patients around the world and how do we think about, although we may discover and develop products in certain countries, to really go and deliver them to others. And it really takes a network, as you were saying, from manufacturing uh, right down to our commercial operations in those countries to make sure that we can deliver them to patients and know where they are. That's why I'm really excited about this topic because if we don't have health equity, we don't have a way to actually get those innovations to patients who so desperately need them. So now we're through with the in introductions and thank you all for joining us. And I, and I do wanna mention we will be taking some, several questions at the end and there are several mics around here. Uh, so get ready with your questions. Um, and I'm gonna be asking some more general questions and I may direct it to one or two of your panelists, but uh, anybody can jump in. Just you know, give me the sign or just talk over the person next to you. That's always an exciting, exciting panel. Um, and so now we're talking about health equity today and developing a shared mindset for all patients. Now I have to tell you, I've been peddling for years the notion if we have the technology to alleviate human suffering, it would be inhumane to deny it to any human. And the technology I'm talking about is pharmaceuticals, relevant diagnostics, appropriate treatments, reasonable health care, quality of health care, health care. So my question to all of the panel is, what is health e equity? How do you define it? Uh, Dr. Varkey, I'm going to start with you. So uh, uh, I'd look at health equity as an equal opportunity for everyone, uh, regardless of where they come from, the language they speak, their ethnicity, their race, uh, where they were born, um, you know, their education, their income levels. Uh, so an equal opportunity for health and wellness. Uh, and if there are social determinants of health, like the ones that I just listed, that are intervening in uh, creating suboptimal outcomes, then we have an issue with health inequity. So it's really creating an equal opportunity for health and wellness for all individuals, uh, regardless of their background. Dr. Mendoza. Yeah, so um, I simply define health equity as attainment of the highest level of health for all. And, and I think it's, it's really important um, to distinguish between um, equity and equality. And, and, and so what I mean by that is if you, if you think about um, um, the pandemic, you have, um, as many of you probably did, you could order tests um, through, the, through the post office, um, COVID-19 tests, and you were limited to, to four tests. Now that's equality, everyone gets four tests, but there are many households that have more than four people. What are you supposed to do about that? So, so that's where the equity piece comes in. Right. Uh, now, Winslow, I have to say, uh, this is, this is you know, the United States, but it's like, this is a global issue. H how do you view health equity globally? Yeah, I would say um, very common themes, this idea that individuals should be able to achieve their highest level of health, I think is critically important. So when I think of health equity, there are some common factors, uh, social factors around equity, but there are also different factors in different countries that need to be addressed as well, because the healthcare systems are really important uh, determinants of 
how healthcare is delivered. And so I think hopefully we'll touch on how we can look at the common factors, but then also those in different countries as well. And many countries with the explosion of innovation are thinking about how can their systems support providing that innovation to their patients, whether it's how they think about affordability um, of those products or how they think about even distribution of those products as well. Can you give us an example of, a, of several countries, perhaps with different health systems, and what that means specifically? Just a couple of concrete examples. Sure. There are some health systems that are very uh, mature health systems, um, and uh, they have single payers. So you can think about the UK, um, and they think about how do they give their access. You can think about uh, a number of uh, different uh, countries whose populations are very much large, and they're figuring out how do they expand that. I know China has a China 2030 strategy. Uh, around their healthcare system. They're also thinking about how they start to endorse things like um, insurance and where that can make a difference. Thinking about national drug listings and how they can then provide access to the broader uh, population because they're private pay and then there's also the broader population as well. So different systems are, are looking at their patients' populations looking at the innovation and saying, what is our challenge? Is it getting it to broader communities? One last one I will say, there's some, some things we'll hopefully touch on, is that rural versus urban. And if I think about Australia or uh, Canada, they're trying to think about how do they reach their native populations and make sure they have the same equity uh, to healthcare as well. So there are a lot of different um, factors that are not just global, but also from a country perspective. Well, if you were listening, and I'm sure you weren't listening this closely, I did throw in two ringers in that last question. I said relevant diagnostics and available treatments. And uh, I know scientists like to create what we call homogeneous uh, backgrounds. And that means you want to study a particular effect, so you have a, a absolutely, you know, almost a, a blank background. It's, so it can be very, it won't affect what you're trying to study. And then you intentionally add several different factors. It might simply be, you know, different dose levels, as if we're talking about pharmaceuticals. And uh, and the more homogeneous the background, the more others can replicate it. And we need replication in science to make sure what we're seeing is is correct. However, this doesn't always work so well. Uh, starting in 1977, the FDA policy restricted clinical trials for drugs solely to men, and after a drug was approved then, doctors would have to sort of take a certain imaginative leap to prescribe it to women. And, uh, but that really made it a lot easier to put these men, you know, just men uh, in these trials. It was a lot easier. And then in 1993, two things happened. FDA revised its policy which required that all drugs be tested by both men and women. And at the same time, because it was coming, this was set into law uh, by Congress with the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993. And it was soon demonstrated that response to, the, to drugs were different in women than men. In fact, any disease itself would be, could be much different in women for the same disease than in men. And that was roughly 30 years ago. So time passes, we're here today. Social responsibilities become more mature. We understand them more. And I realize today that race and ethnicity in clinical trials are essential. Not everyone responds to the drugs the same way or to the diagnostics or to, or, or to any number of, of how one would administer a treatment. So Dr. Mendoza, in your previous position at the FDA, that's the Food and Drug Administration, which has oversight over all clinical trials uh, testing on human, uh, you, humans, you were the primary author of the FDA guidance document. We usually say guidelines, and FDA speak, you say guidance. And that was collection of race and ethnicity data in clinical trials. What does it say? How do we have to do it? Thanks, Maura. So um, I just want to uh, just add a little bit of context for anyone not familiar with the FDA. Um, as Maura said, this is the Food and Drug Administration, and it's responsible um, for regulating approximately one-fifth of, of the U.S. economy, which is just, if you think about it, that's just massive. And, and, and so when you talk about the guidance document, um, as you just mentioned, you know, not all races and ethnicities are going to respond the same way to a certain drug or a biologic like a vaccine. And, and so, so we need that diversity. And so what the guidance document that I wrote, um, it does a couple of things. One, it provides standardization. 
that when you conduct your clinical trial, you, you need to report race and ethnicity in a standardized way. So at the FDA, um, we would often see trials that come in where the data was reported as far as race goes as just black and white. Um, there's, there are obviously more racial groups than that, and so that creates a problem when you try to analyze the data. How, how do you know how um, folks that are not black and white are gonna respond? Um, the, the second thing it did is that um, it said for the first time in writing that um, FDA wants the folks that are in the participant in clinical trials, um, they want those demographics to match the demographics of the, the condition or disease the medical product is, is trying to treat. So if you're trying to treat diabetes, um, you know, there's a certain percentage of Hispanics that, um, you know, suffer disproportionately from the disease, you should, you should try to ensure that your trial has at least, if not greater than that amount of Hispanics in the trial. And the third thing it did was that it, it said that uh, companies or sponsors in FDA speak, um, they needed to engage with FDA at the earliest stages of development um, for, of their drug or their biologic um, in the development process. So that means, um, as far as um, creating a plan for inclusion. So that means that um, FDA doesn't want companies, sponsors coming to them, you know, when you're in the later stages of your clinical trial and, you know, bringing up the diversity and inclusion aspect then. It needs to be all the way at the beginning towards, more towards the phase one um, part of, of the trial. Because what we found is that if you try and, um, include diverse populations and you're already well into your trial, it's almost pointless. It's not gonna happen. Th these considerations need to be thought about at the very beginning, way before the first patient is ever enrolled. And, and so that's what the guidance document did. It, it, uh, it talked about all three of those things and why they were so important um, in the clinical trial space. Now for those of you who aren't familiar with this, there is, the, well there's preclinical, which often means animal testing, and we're hoping to have some alternatives to that as many of the animals and many of the policies are changing to get away from animal testing, but it's still preclinical. We're not trying to put the drug into humans per se or in a way that makes, makes a difference, that, that has an impact. They're, they're not consuming it. Uh, that's a whole other panel. That's a great panel, by the way. Um, and, uh, uh, but then, first of all, you give it to healthy volunteers. So does it, how does it affect healthy people? That's usually pretty fast, phase one. Then phase two, you start to work on the dosage, and it's, it gets more. You get a little sense for how much you can do. Might be one at a time, might be cumulative. And then you get to the big phase threes. Through all of those, even before you even think about getting to phase one or phase zero, there's another little phase zero that's come along, you have to really be in communication with the FDA. Describe to us that kind of interaction. Sure. Okay. Since you used to work there, I was kind of <laughs> yes. looking at you. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, company. We need to be clear that companies are are not required um, to come to the FDA with their with their clinical trials. Um, they are highly encouraged to do so, but it, it's not. Um, but it, it's not required. Um, but um, what we um, at least what we like to think is that if a company does come to the FDA, you know, it, it's, it's going to uh, provide for a, a more smooth um, uh, process, uh, uh, approval process, if in fact the, the drug does get approved. And, and so when a company does come to FDA, um, they are, uh, they engage with, with a team of FDA folks, um, from biologists, chemists, statisticians, um, project managers that will really walk them through the process if, if they want to um, and, you know, and, and advise um, on some of the best practices for their trial, again, if, if they ask for it. Now, if there's one thing that's come into its own during the pandemic, it was the increased use of all technology, but also telemedicine. You know, can you take a picture? Can you Zoom with us? Can we have an email? What can we do? Um, however, Telemedicine requires literacy, patient available technology, and wireless communication often. But let's talk about the frontiers of telemedicine and how it might be used in clinical trials as well. And so that's sort of, I've got a two-point two thing here. So I'm actually going to start with you, Dr. Varkey. It's like, 
How did telemedicine unfold uh, during the pandemic in the Mayo Clinic health system? So um, digital health, as you know, was a huge part of uh, the transformation that uh, occurred across healthcare uh, in the U.S. and globally during the pandemic. Um, it existed to some extent before the pandemic, but it really exploded and really took shape. Uh, and we all learned much more uh, during the pandemic. A large number of visits in the early part, in the first phase of the pandemic as clinics were shut down, were related to telehealth and were done through telehealth. Uh, also specialty consults, primary care to specialty, were done through uh, telehealth. Uh, an interesting um, uh, observation as we talked about some of the disparities with rural communities is that many rural communities do not have uh, expanded wireless access uh, or 5G networks. And so how do you do telehealth and provide digital health in that kind of arena? Uh, and so we had to learn a lot and uh, frankly bring in some of those wireless networks through mobile health clinics where we brought in vans with uh, wireless access in collaboration with stakeholders, uh, and we're able to deliver telehealth uh, in that fashion in, in uh, rural communities. Uh, we did uh, advanced care at home, so when hospitals were full and we really needed to expand hospital capacity, we really brought hospital to the homes. Uh, and again, did that in collaboration with multiple stakeholders, bringing in that wireless technology, bringing in uh, healthcare providers and all the advanced monitoring uh, that uh, was able to keep a large number of patients, about 1,700 patients, since we started uh, some of these pilots across Mayo Clinic and Mayo Clinic Health System last year, uh, and really provide excellent care at home uh, where patients were hospitalized and were able to uh, be with their family members and really reduce the need uh, to have them admitted to the hospital. So a lot of innovations have occurred, I think, because of the pandemic and really accelerated in the digital space, and those continue. And, and I uh, am really excited that those continue to evolve as uh, we slowly come out of the pandemic. Uh, I'd also say uh, we learned a lot in terms of using data uh, in understanding healthcare disparities and really using that, uh, again, to solve for some of these uh, healthcare disparities. Uh, we'd mentioned uh, you know, some of the social determinants of health that were uh, contributing perhaps to different outcomes in, in uh, patients of different color and ethnicity and, and uh, based on their background. So what we've committed to is uh, in almost every single metric uh, as it relates to uh, reviewing quality outcomes in healthcare, we add additional health equity metrics. And this is new since, uh, you know, over the last year and a half. Uh, so that we're really able to understand if patients are having differential outcomes and course correct very quickly. And also look at all uh, very critical decision trees using clinical algorithms and ensure that inherent biases are proactively addressed and, uh, and, and uh, taken care of so that we avoid these kind of healthcare disparities. So uh, I think, you know, while the pandemic caused obviously lots of uh, uh, stress and, and uh, issues across the globe, I do think that it also catapulted a lot of transformation in terms of digital health and the forefront in terms of the transformation that needs to occur. Measurement. I always love measurement. Now, how do you measure good and bad outcomes with, or differential outcomes with telemedicine? Tell us, or telehealth, give us a couple of concrete examples here. Um, so it could be clinical outcomes, it could be uh, patient experience outcomes, and we measure both. So, uh, you know, uh, whether it is, uh, for example, in treatment of heart failure or diabetes, how, uh, how is the hemoglobin A1C doing, uh, you know, if, if it's managed uh, through uh, telehealth versus in person, uh, or is uh, gender or racial uh, or ethnicity paying, uh, playing a role in terms of differential outcomes. So those are the clinical outcomes. We also look at patient experience in terms of their experience throughout the visit uh, in a physical visit versus a non-physical visit. Uh, are readmissions, for example, increasing uh, if patients are seen through, through telehealth versus physical visits? So uh, lots of metrics like that that, that are calibrated and, and uh, measured as part of both telehealth as well as in-person in visits. What part of the time is it the technology that fails, and what part of the time is it just humans using technology? We learned a lot. Uh, that's a great question. We learned a lot through the pandemic, and we're getting better. Uh, one of the things we learned was uh, engaging the patient ahead of the telehealth visit. 
so that the technology part of the situation was uh, uh, you know, addressed, the patients were oriented ahead of the telehealth visit. Uh, and when necessary, we did, just to be frank, we did uh, switch to phone visits uh, early <laughs> on in the, uh, in the pandemic. But uh, we did learn a lot about technology, uh, educating our healthcare providers, the processes, as well as educating patients ahead of time uh, in terms of the use of the technology. I'm actually reminded years ago, I worked with the USDA, their Nutrition Research Center, and uh, one of their they have many centers, but one particular one. And we had uh, we were doing nutrition me measurement uh, from automatically with uh, teenagers, with mid-aged. I think it took a lot of committees to call them mid-aged, and then seniors. And today we would never call them seniors, but. The seniors didn't have a lot of experience with technology, but they did well. And the mid-age, they did great. They actually used it all at work. And then the teenage, the teenage girls were spectacular. The teenage boys were horrible. <laughs> I remember watching. A lot, why are why is this data coming out? This guy took a half a coke and put it on the scale, logged it out, saying I'm done with it, and then picked it up and drank from it and put it over. <laughs> it was like. Teenage boys, don't involve them in science. Don't want to do this. And so there's a whole lot to be said about who people are, what they understand, how they use technology. And, uh, and so the second part of this question, uh, it's the, the uh, part of telemedicine, not just the treatment, is clinical trials, global clinical trials. And uh, that, you know, we have to collect a number of samples. We have to do it. And don't forget, every country has their own equivalent of the FDA. Some of them may get together. Some it's it's very complicated. I mean, with Brexit, um, you know, what's the uh, only Ireland is the only country besides Gibraltar, besides Malta, which is English speaking. So that when you submit your application to the EU, you don't submit it in English. You've got to do it in French and German. It's like, wait a minute, this was all in English. Now what are we going to do? I mean, these are huge, huge things, and so. Uh, you, it's one thing to say it works, we proved it with the FDA, and uh, now we're just going to go market it to the world. You've got to go through all of these. What is that like, Winslow? And are we able to use any of the telemedicine techniques to, to help that along? Yes, I, I would say I, I've got a good example. Um, I talked about Australia, and I, I think in Australia there's a program that we have as part of our reconciliation action plan, and, and it's a a, a trial that's being done in rare cancers and using telehealth platforms to use for clinical trials. They're able to um, enroll patients that don't have access to clinical trials, they're able to generate data in those patient populations and see what those treatments are doing. Why that's also important is it allows them for, to advocate for access for those medicines afterwards. So it's coming together, as you were saying, that technology and then also how we develop products and clinical trials and trying to solve some of those issues along from the development right down to how do we think about getting more access for patients as well. How do you deal with the fact that there are many languages? That's critically important. Uh, one of the things that we found is uh, during the pandemic, we didn't have our normal access to um, educate, I would say, on our treatments. And so what we had to do overnight is take what were written types of pieces and then develop those to be uh, included in telehealth, included in digital ways of going about it. In some ways, it's interesting because you can, we're learning, you can develop content, and you have to develop it for digital, which is very different. So you have to think about, as you said, how do we translate it into the languages? But not just that, it's how do you also deliver those in a way that they're consumed, and they're consumed differently digitally than they are in, in, in person as well. So as this is growing, um, and I think it is true, we face some issues during the pandemic, which are going to make us better after the pandemic, which hopefully will help us to address some of these issues, these uh, disparities. Were your clinical trials slowed down at all by the pandemic? They were. They were slowed down in the beginning. We got much better at, at trying to figure out how we uh, access patient populations, and it helped a little bit. You had a contribution, Dr. Yeah, I actually wanted to touch on the education front uh, and just talk about how digital became very important for health professions education as well, and continuing that through the two years of the pandemic, uh, whether it was medical students, residents, uh, nursing students, et cetera. So keeping education going uh, and growing uh, through the pandemic using digital technology was one uh, important one. 
And the last thing I wanted to uh, add was uh, the workforce uh, and keeping our uh, workforce engaged through digital technology and through uh, Zoom meetings and, and Microsoft Team meetings was very critical, especially as knowledge was evolving, uh, as stories had to be shared very quickly, uh, and also keep that social context, uh, context live and, and uh, the staff inspired. We're also piloting um, virtual nurses, uh, physicians, uh, you know, supervising, phys uh, you know, virtually, uh, whether it's in the emergency medicine or hospitalists, um, the ICUs, the OBGYN visits, you know, I mean, all of those really exploded. Again, they, there were fragments of these in existence before the pandemic, but really exploded and, and really transformed uh, over the last two years as well. In clinical trials, you know, we often think if we have a drug in the United States, it must have been trialed here in the United States. But there, are, we don't have enough people for all the clinical trials that are going on. Uh, and yet it's extremely important where is the, not just who is in the trial, but, but where the trial was conducted and where the ultimate population is. We were talking uh, earlier, Dr. Mendoza, about a rejection by the FDA recently. Why don't you describe that? And, and let's, let's look at that problem. Yeah, so, um, so recently um, an FDA advisory committee um, recommended um, against not approving an oncology drug uh, put forth by um, Eli Lilly. And the reason they, they did that was because um, they stated that the, the folks, the participants in the trial, um, they didn't reflect um, the demographics of the US. And specifically, this trial was done in just one country, um, China, I believe. And, and, and so really, this is a, a historic moment um, for, for the FDA. Um, because previously, if, if it was simply that the data was, was sound, um, the conclusions were sound, the research was sound, everything was done appropriately, you know, the, the product would more than likely be approved, um, even if it was just um, limited demographics in the trial. But here, um, we saw the, this FDA advisory panel um, really take note of the demographics in the trial and say, no, th this is not acceptable. And, and so I, I think um, that's a huge step forward for us. And, and, you know, and I think if, if there are any um, positives that have come out of the pandemic, um, it's this heightened awareness of disparities and um, especially racial and ethnic disparities and you know, that one size doesn't fit all. And, and so um, while, I, while I don't know the inner conversations of the, F, of the FDA, what went into this particular decision, um, other than what they've released, I, I can't help but to think that that um, greater awareness um, was on the minds of at least a few of those folks. Did you want to say something? I, I did. I wanted to add that um, it is really interesting because it shows that equity is really important. It's not just the, the, the right thing to do. It's a smart thing to do because we get more inclusive innovation. We uh, get better science, uh, ultimately. And so I think that that was a good example of saying that we are have to put health equity at the forefront of, of how we think about delivering and developing innovation. It, it is very interesting because we often, for instance, associate obesity with type 2 diabetes. And uh, it was discovered during a set of clinical trials that, in fact, Asian women don't store their fat on the outside, they, store, they layer it on the inside. That's where they happen to uh, do it from their genetics. So testing and evaluating people and all this stuff, it's like we need far more information about everybody. Dr. Mendoza. I, and I just want to add, um, you know, I think this becomes even more important when we think how the U.S. is moving to this minority majority population status um, I think the census projection is somewhere around 2045. And so, you know, uh, from my personal stances, it's best that we figure out how to do this now, how to get those inclusive populations in the trials now than in 2045 when, you know, when we're, when we're already there as far as a minority-majority population and you start having, you potentially start having um, all these um, adverse reactions or side effects from, from products that didn't go through a trial process that was inclusive of of all the relevant demographics. Great. 
Now let's uh, and get your questions ready pretty soon here. We're going to let you ask them. Um, the uh, rural versus urban. We usually consider those to be two different situations. You're very, very used to the rural area. Everyone is used to many different things. What is the difference between health equity in rural versus urban populations? And where are they the same and where are they different? How, are, how is that, is, is, it, is it different or are there some similarities? So um, as many of you know, one in five Americans live in rural uh, communities. Uh, in, an, in Mayo Clinic Health System, about 60% of our communities are rural. Uh, I think I alluded a little bit to the difference in access in rural communities as it relates to wireless availability. And, and so as we look at digital health strategy, that becomes a crucial um, you know, uh, point of discussion as we talk about healthcare disparities and, and equalizing the opportunity for, for digital access. Uh, and so building coalitions, uh, whether it is uh, through public affairs, through government agencies, through technology communi uh, uh, communities and, and also through multiple industries to enhance access in rural communities becomes very critical as we look at the digital forefront uh, as we emerge out of the pandemic. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if you look at the US and worldwide, uh, we have more closures of hospitals and clinics in rural communities than not. Uh, and, and so in many of the communities that we serve, for example, uh, we are the largest employer, and, and so the, you know, the hospitals are not just important for healthcare, obviously, but also the economic engine of the community. So how do we make sure that our rural communities have access, both physical and digital access, uh, to uh, treatments, to prevention? Uh, you know, we uh, read and, and uh, talked a lot about monoclonal antibody infusions uh, during the pandemic. We know that uh, it kept about 70% of people from being hospitalized or, or getting severe COVID disease. So how do we make those kind of uh, uh, cures and treatments available very quickly in our rural communities? And that was something we focused on a lot during the pandemic. So it's those kind of questions where uh, there might be um, inequitable access to the latest technologies or latest cures uh, and, and, and a focus on prevention that are quite different uh, in rural communities. Those are some of the, some of the differences between rural and urban communities. I, I, I think that's, that's a great point, and I think it means that we have to think about delivery of products and how we can think about uh, delivering to rural communities. Sometimes it's, we are thinking about how can we think about home infusions potentially as being helpful, uh, different um, sort of formulations and so forth, to your point, to address the specific needs of those patient populations when we think about their access to infused products. Well, once it works, you've got technology gets better, faster, cheaper. Does that help? Yeah, and I'll also add that um, healthcare providers and staffing is quite different in rural communities versus urban communities. And so we've, for example, uh, had to really look at community paramedics. So these are emergency, uh, you know, ambulance professionals that might go to uh, people's homes. And how do we educate them on social determinants of health and really use them to uh, connect individuals to, uh, you know, social opportunities uh, that might influence uh, health. And so we've really had to look at community health workers, uh, community paramedics, and really uh, focusing on developing coalitions with existing uh, voluntary organizations, perhaps it's churches, it's, uh, you know, organizations in the community that, that are very interested uh, in, in health care and, and the surrounding influences to health care. Uh, and so those partnerships have also become very important in rural communities versus urban communities. Well, is, is the di difference distance between urban and rural, or are there other differences? Uh, the, the size of the population. So typically less than 50,000 would classify as a rural population. But farm, no, but I, what I'm saying is oh, that... Oh, the distance also, yes. The absolutely. distance you travel for this or that to get them there. Absolutely. But is it the same problem with low socioeconomic people in in achieving health equity? Yeah, so, um, you know, the distances uh, are, uh, could be important in rural communities. Some of them are hard to reach, which is why we talked about, uh, you know, introducing mobile clinics where we are actually driving to the rural communities and providing care. Uh, I think, you know, in terms of socially disadvantaged populations, there was another interesting 
uh, thing that came up uh, during the pandemic, which is we talked a lot about social isolation uh, if you got COVID, but think about uh, crowded housing. Uh, and, you know, so how do you address those kind of things as, as uh, uh, you know, in the midst of a pandemic? So a lot of other things that we had to learn about and we're learning uh, as healthcare organizations uh, through the pandemic. Great. Well, one more question before we go to the real questions. Um, precision medicine. We haven't talked about this as, as a group. It's one-on-one. -on -one. We're taking something about you, decoded about you, to give you the right medicine or to create a medicine for you. How, how do we describe health equity in those terms? I can take a stab at um, uh, algorithms uh, as it relates to health equity. Um, uh, one of the things that we learned very quickly um, over the last few years is just as we have uh, biases in society, um, we talked a little bit about uh, inclusivity in research. And so inclusivity matters in developing some of these algorithms as well. And so if you're not careful you're essentially using an algorithm that's based on one segment of a population and trying to interpret it uh, for treatments or preventions uh, for a different segment of population that has not been trialed. And, and uh, that is well known uh, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence algorithms and, and uh, inherent biases uh, because of lack of um, uh, you know, inclusion of, of some of these uh, disparate populations. So, uh, that's something you know we we are closely looking at and and studying as healthcare organizations. Uh, at, at Mayo, for example, we have uh, a center for digital health that's really looking at labeling some of the studies that have been done to understand if they have been inclusive, and developing some of these standards nationally uh, to understand uh, which data sets are free of those kind of biases. Uh, and I'll just give a very, uh, you know, uh, concrete example. For example, uh, take a case of melanoma uh, in a patient that has colored skin versus uh, a patient that has lighter skin. So if the studies or the algorithms are based on uh, a population that has lighter skin, the interpretation or the diagnosis in a darker skinned individual is going to be pretty inaccurate. Uh, so it's those kind of things that, of course, uh, take that to uh, multiple conditions and treatments. So uh, that's something we're very acutely aware of and that we need to do much more work in nationally. Does anyone want to approach the microphone here? A question? Great. Go ahead. There's another microphone back there. Is that mic on? Bobby? Doesn't say, but the tech people are coming out to you now. All set? There you go. Sorry Thank about you. that. So uh, I don't want to step on a soapbox here, but I, I do want to address the elephant in the room. Um, how do we address health equity when we live in a nation? where non-scientific individuals with political agendas have a say in what our CDC can say or what our healthcare professionals can deliver. I'm an out proud transgender woman and the last political um, administration was overtly hostile to me. Here we're having this wonderful event in a state that denies women reproductive health opportunities and that has just had an overt assault on transgender children. And I know we're talking some great science that um, is gonna benefit a lot of people, but if the political bodies that are in charge are gonna keep that um, science from the people that could benefit from it, what good is it in, in the first place? Thank you for your question. Let me. Yeah. Let me, let me add to that question is we have political perspectives, political policies, guidances, uh, changes over time. How does that affect the medicines we deliver and, and how we deliver it? And, uh, 
and how do we deal with that, both here and worldwide? Winslow, go ahead. I'll take a stab at it. Thank you very much for the question. One of the things we're learning is that we have a focus on diversity and inclusion. We also have a focus on health equity. Those two things are somewhat connected. What I mean by that is that um, we're very much focused on clinical trial representation, absolutely. We're voc also focused on the uh, supplier diversity, so we have different thoughts. We learned that we need to be focused on what our employees are interested in as well. So one, we are focused on how do we make sure we have a diverse employee base, because that's important. How do we support the causes that are important to them? And we now support employee giving. I think it's a way that we have to think about you can't have uh, diversity uh, in clinical trials and uh, health equity unless we recognize it as a start with the diverse populations, respecting them and including them in the process. So I think that's uh, over the pandemic, we saw this social change. I think all of that comes together as well, and we have to recognize that. Right. Dr. Mendoza, any contribution there? Yeah, so um, I would also add to Winslow, um, you know, we're, we're talking about diversity and inclusion and, and health equity in, in these, um, in, in research, um, it, it extends not just to the participants, um, but also to the researchers that, that are the ones that are, gonna, that are, you know, asking those scientific questions. Because if we don't have a diversity there, then we're gonna keep getting the same old questions being asked over and over again. And so at all of us, we've made um, having a, a diversity of researchers um, as, a, as just as high as priority as having a, di a diversity of participants in our program. Yeah, I couldn't agree with uh, both of you more. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the one other uh, thing I would add is to continue to be focused on evidence-based uh, medicine and practices as we uh, move forward in healthcare. And I, of course, will keep repeating my old saw. If we have the technology to alleviate human suffering, it's inhumane to deny it to any human. It's very simple. It's very simple. Next question. Oh, okay, you, and then you over there, and then you find a microphone. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the, for the comments. Uh, my name is Greg Smiley. I'm the founder and CEO of Adira Foundation. It's a um, uh, foundation investing in better lives for people with neurodegenerative diseases, but in, in, in practice, it's looking to find, working towards the common good. So we're looking to find better services that you know, are broadly applicable no matter what your diagnosis is. Um, and, you know, we struggle with trying to determine how we're going to move the needle on health equity. And we're curious, are there particular indicators that sort of bubble up to the top again and again? I know it's a very broad mandate, health equity, but uh, Dr. Farkey, I think you're talking about um, uh, clinical outcomes, but also So I'm, I, I, there's two, two uh, parts to the, the question, I think. Uh, the first is the health equity indicators. Uh, and we've talked about uh, some of those earlier on in the panel discussion. That include um, ethnicity, race, uh, you know, education, literacy, um, you know, household income, things like that. So, uh, and, and, and those are important to connect those social determinants of health are important to connect to clinical outcomes, whether they are clinical process outcomes related to neurogen, you know, the, the issues that you're interested in uh, in your institute uh, or patient experiences. So it's it's really both of those coming in together uh, and um, using quality metrics that exist for the, for the particular condition or diseases that you're interested in, but ensuring that you're also looking at social determinants of health and those health equity metrics to make sure that the outcomes are not different for individuals uh, that are disadvantaged. And first we measure, and then we have to decide what is a, an acceptable level, or an acceptable thing. That's, if we didn't have it before, we couldn't have that conversation. Yes, in the back. Uh, 
Affordability. Thank you. Let's take, go ahead, Winston. Thank you for the question. I'll, I'll start. Um, a couple of things. I think uh, I'll talk about Bristol Myers Squibb has been on a journey for health equity for, for quite some time. And we keep thinking about how do we expand those tools and those uh, collaborations to make sure that we can get to the point of what you're talking about. Um, what I focus on is intercontinental. That is all of the countries outside of the US, uh, Europe, and Japan. So when you talk about Southeast Asia and so forth, that is very much uh, of mine. Um, there are two pieces there. The first is around affordability. It's around making sure that our products can get to those countries. Um, in some of them, they're very different healthcare systems. So, well, lots of times we're talking about how do we demonstrate outcomes so we can get value, the right value for, for, for patients. All, and also it's all about how do we think about connecting with the system. For example, uh, we had a lot of focus in, in HIV at one point and we figured out how do we get those to those different countries. It is about um, bringing the medicines there it's about making sure you have a sustainable way to distribute those medicines. And so we think about those as well. So um, overall, affordability is critically important. As a company, we think about how do we make our products affordable at a certain price. But we also uh, work with governments to figure out how do we do that in a way that we can have the value that is sustainable as well. You also might refer to look up uh, DNDI, the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative in Geneva, led by Dr. Bernard Picule, and uh, they're looking at diseases that are large populations that basically have no wherewithal, no economic wherewithal. And so these are just examples of different efforts to bring about treatments to beyond underserved, unserved populations, and that we're all taking on, you know, including large pharmaceutical companies. How do, we, how do we now take care of the world? How do we go about it? It is not just international, it's above that. How do we do it as humanity? Next question. Hi, um, Sally Bach. I'm with the COVID Vaccine Prevention Network. We ran, at Fred Hutch, we ran the phase three trials for all the US funded COVID vaccines. Um, we had over 40% BIPOC participation across our trials, um, which was wonderful. It's unfortunately the exception. And my question for you is, um, looking forward to the back end of clinical trials, if you're building trusted relationships, you owe your volunteers information and transparency about the trials, peer-reviewed uh, journal policies, sponsor policies, all of that get in the way of having um, immediate, clear communications back to the volunteers about the outcomes of the trials? I and mean, what do you all think can be done, is in process of being done, as you know, communications transform with digital tools, et cetera? How do we fill the gap on the back end, not just make it possible for them to participate in the trials more easily with the digital tool, but to turn around information um, and feed it back to the people that so generously participated in the trial? I might refer you to Bioethics International, headed by Jennifer Miller. She's uh, Dr. Miller's also a professor at Yale Medical School, um, and they track uh, the sharing of clinical trials data, and they work with lots of all the pharmaceutical companies, and a number of them are published. You know, they may be somewhat delayed, or they're delayed until. You finish phase three and you've got an accepted drug as an example. Um, and so a number of those are available, but we are dealing with, with the, the greatest amount of innovation is coming through pharmaceutical companies. And this is something that they've got to have. It is their work product. And uh, we're seeing a lot of sharing 
<laughs> once the product is released, once the product is there. So I'm just saying that's one of the efforts that's uh, going on. I don't know, do you want to say anything? Go ahead, Dr. Mendoza. Hi, so I'll, I'll just say that I completely agree with your point that returning value to the participants is, is absolutely huge. And, and so, you know, for instance, at the All of Us Research Program, this is one of our, our core priorities. So we return value to, um, to folks in, in a number of ways. Um, we um, provide, um, if so, if you decide to provide us with a, a blood, a urine, or a saliva sample, we can return your, uh, your genetic and ancestry results, um, similar to like a, a 23andMe, um, that type of, um, of return. And, and later on, um, the plan is to also start returning um, health-related variant um, types of results as well. So for us, we really want to build that relationship with our participants and, and treat them as, as our partners, um, you know, and return value to them at every step along um, the way of the process. And there's also further a trend in which what we, we call it phase four, that you go in and you, as, as people are taking them, now you have it in the wild. You have the medications in the wild, they're using it with other drugs, et cetera. But a mindset on all of us that if we are taking such drugs, that certain amount of our uh, anonymized, and I think that's the last question, I'm very sorry, but we will be here afterward to ask uh, off, off camera here, off of mic, that, um, that we will be able to see um, a, number of, a number of things uh, uh, coming to fruition. Uh, and so I want to wrap up now with a last word from each of the panelists, and I'm thinking about 30 seconds to a minute long. Um, I think we certainly understand that today's conversation about health equity is a very rich fabric, so it can't be achieved in one place or by one organization. And if you would share with us one aspect or a number of aspects, whatever it is, any aspect of health equity that you're personally resolved to work on in the next year or two about bringing it about, I'd really appreciate it. And, and let me start first with you, Dr. Mendoza. So thanks, Maureen, and thanks for, to my fellow panelists for a, a really wonderful experience. So um, I'm personally resolved uh, around health equity um, to focusing on one specific aspect that I talked about earlier, and that is um, bringing in diverse researchers um, to uh, our program. We already have um, uh, a very diverse research cohort um, as far as participants go, and our researchers that are accessing that data are also diverse, but I, I, I want to sort of supercharge that. Um, even more because, again, if we don't have those diverse researchers asking those diverse questions, having a diversity of thought in our science, um, we're, we're not going to achieve health equity. So um, that's what I'm personally resolved to. Great. Uh, Dr. Varki. Uh, as we emerge out of the pandemic, uh, I'm personally uh, interested in spending more time with our staff and our communities really learning more about their experiences, uh, what we could have done better, and um, what we need to do uh, as we look forward to transforming the future of healthcare from a population health perspective. Winslow. Yeah, I would say uh, um, two things. I think that uh, health equity is critically important and we can achieve it. I'm very committed to, in the different countries, working with our groups to understand how can we make the biggest impact in those countries um, individually, because that's where I think about outside the U.S. is where I spend a lot of my time, and really understanding in each of those countries, what can we do that will make a bigger impact in each of them? And there are some themes, but there are some specific individual ones that I think we can focus on. Which individuals are those? Yeah, so um, as I said, it depends on the country itself. I can tell you in some countries we have great access. We have great access in the uh, private sector, not in the public sector. Getting more access in the public sector, whether it is Brazil, whether it is China, that will have a tremendous impact on the access of our products. And so that's what I'm very interested in because right. while we bring innovation there, how can we spread it further? Well, thank you very much. You've been a terrific audience. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Dr. Fahiba Varki from the Mayo Clinic Health System, Dr. Men Mar Martin Mendoza from NIH and the All of Us Research Program, and Winslow Tucker from Bristol-Myers Squibb. Thank you all, and have a great South by Southwest.